Welcome to a quick walkthrough of how to orchestrate uh, lambdas. Um, this is basically the uh, serverless function orchestration use case I'm showing here. Um, I'm giving a talk at the AWS Community Summit this week. So this will be recorded and available and talks a bit more about the why. So this really concentrates on the walkthrough and probably can help you if you want to want to like try it yourself. So all the code is available on my GitHub account. There's the trip booking circuit serverless repo where you can look into that. The business story behind is a very simple one, which is used very often. Um, you, are, you have a couple of functions, one to book a hotel, one to book a rental car, one to book a flight, and you want to provide a, bit, a, bit, uh, a trip booking function that needs to orchestrate the others like um, for example, here we want to do that in a sequence. And we also have to make sure, for example, if the flight booking fails, that we have to um, undo the others, which basically mean canceling the car and canceling the hotel. Okay, that's the whole idea here. Relatively simple scenario. If you look at the functions, they are also um, very uh, straightforward. So they are written uh, in JavaScript, Node.js here. Um, so what I basically have, I have an input. Um, this has a body element, and in the body, um, I have a string that contains uh, JSON, so I can parse it, and then I have a JSON object where I have probably a couple of attributes. For example, if there's an attribute book hotel failure, um, and this is set to true, then I simulate a failure of booking the hotel, which basically means the function gives back a result where it says success uh, equals false. In the other case, it successfully books a hotel and says success equals true. Uh, very simple function. And the other ones are more or less the same, right? So um, I can deploy them on my AWS account. So it basically says serverless deploy. I'm using the serverless framework here in order to do that, and that will take a bit. And then I will have the functions available. The next piece I need is I need a workflow engine uh, an orchestration engine to orchestrate these functions. And I'm using Commander Cloud here. You can um, try it out yourself. Um, you can just create a test account, for example, very easily. And then it can immediately create your own CB cluster. CB is the workflow engine used within Commander Cloud. So let's do that. Um, let's say I want to have Lambda Fun. I'm using a small cluster here. That's sufficient um, for me. You could also use even a development cluster. And then this workflow engine gets provisioned for you. Um, right, so that's the workflow engine, but I also need a workflow definition in order to define my orchestration. ZB uses BPMN. BPMN is an ISO standard to define these kind of workflows. Um, that's a simple model here where we say, hey, whenever somebody requests a trip, this is where it starts. Then the first thing we do is we want to um, invoke the first Lambda in order to book the hotel. In BPMN, that's a so-called service task. And now um, what I can do is I can um, wire that with um, Lambda. So I say, hey, this is a Lambda. And in the headers, I can configure the Lambda invocation. So for example, I need a function name to be called. This is my trip booking functions dev book hotel. That's the function name, um, basically, which I have in um, AWS. So um, yeah, you can see the function names here. You can also, if you want to, you can also um, look into your AWS console, web console, and you can, will also see the same function names here, right? So that's the function I use. Um, then I define the, um, basically the data handed over to the function. In my case, I want to send over JSON, which is a body element. You probably remember that from the JavaScript code early on. And that contains a string um, where I want to have a JSON um, basically string, so I use an escape version here, of all the variables. What are variables? Every workflow instance can have variables. It's basically key value pairs, which you can store alongside the workflow instance. And I just put all of them into that body, which is not probably not what you want to do in production, but for an easy example, that's um, easy to do. Um, you can use this kind of templating mechanism to even like build different data structures if you want to. Then whenever that function is called, you get back a result and that result is stored in a variable called book hotel result. Right? Then you can use that variable to, uh, for example, make decisions like this is a so-called XOR gateway. And that means I go either the way that way or the other. 
and this is decided on the book hotel result. If the success attribute is true, I go this way, and if it's not true, I go the other way, right? And then the same thing for the book car. It's again a lambda, and I have some header. So, and the same for basically all of them. By the way, a BPMN file underneath is always an XML, so you can do the same thing in XML if you like. So, for example, especially for these kind of things, it's sometimes pretty handy to also look to the XML sources. You don't have to use a graphical modeler even if it's typically very convenient. Um, what I need to do in order to use it, I have to deploy that workflow onto my um, ZB cluster in the cloud. I could use a command line tool or some other ways, but I want to use the button here in the modeler, which basically says, hey, I want to deploy to cloud. I have to um, basically provide my cluster ID. And of course, I need credentials in order to do that. And therefore, I have to create a client. Um, basically client credentials. Um, in this case, that's my modeler. Uh, what I get is a client ID, which I need over here. And I also get a secret, um, which I use over here. As soon as I have all of that, it can connect to my cluster. I can deploy um, that workflow, right? So that's successful. So um, what you can see then, um, if you go to the um, console operate is, the yeah the operation tool it basically looks into the state of the workflow engine what's currently going on i see that i have that workflow deployed now but nothing is going on not too surprising what i can do um, directly from the model as well i can kick off a new instance if i like to um, in this case without any data so it's just like kicked off um, if you remember the lambdas i showed you briefly um, if I don't pass any data, it means it runs successful. So what I would expect is that these functions basically run through in a straight line and we will see the happy path executed. So let's go back. Let's refresh here. And you see um, one instance, right? We can look into the instance and it's currently waiting here at the book hotel. Hmm. Why it's waiting? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> so um, what we have now is uh, the AWS functions on the one side and Kamunda Cloud on the other side. We still need to combine these two. And um, there are multiple ways of doing that, but the one I want to show today is the um, so-called Lambda Worker. Um, so this is basically a small piece of uh, a small piece uh, of code that can connect to CB. And the way to connect to CB is kind of a publish subscribe mechanism. So whenever I say um, this is a Lambda, so this type name is kind of a topic name if you're more messaging, um, means that I can subscribe to Lambda. I can do Lambdas. So this worker can do Lambdas. It subscribes to it. Whenever there's some new service task here um, with a Lambda, this one gets it and can do something. And in this case, it invokes uh, Lambda natively using the AWS SDK, right? Um, there's a big advantage of doing it like this. This worker can run in your AWS account and security-wise, it's pretty close to your um, functions in this case. So you don't have to expose them remotely, right? Um, the only thing you have to do is to run that um, worker. There are a couple of different ways of doing that. So if you scroll down, so there's a documentation what you can do, what you can configure and so on and so forth. And the easiest way to run that worker is actually via Docker. So that um, makes it possible also to run it um, via AWS Fargate, for example, and have a small um, container running in your uh, environment. I'm, for the sake of simplicity, I just run it locally. So Docker run. Then I provide basically a couple of uh, environment variables to um, configure the connection to Kamada Cloud and AWS. I already have the AWS connection configured, but I created a new cluster and I have to configure that here. So I have my end file here, say basically looking at the cluster ID, bum, 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 cluster ID. Then I create a new client. That's actually the best practice. So um, if you have different types of client, they should have their own credentials because that's much easier to um, control. Um, 
of course you could reuse technically you can always reuse the credentials but let's do a new one right so um, now this worker can connect to aws on the one side and um, cb on the other side um, as you can see it's written in java um, source code is in the github repo if you want to look at that it's a community extension so it's not supported as part of the core product that's probably important to know if it starts up um, you can already see that it starts to invoke lambdas um, so, for example, here it invokes the Lambda um, book flight with some payload. It gets back a result here um, that the flight booking was successful. Right. So, with that one running, if I go back to my console, right, you can already see that the trip booking um, completed. One important observation is that it the workflow waited at the um, book hotel because the worker was not running. And that's totally intended behavior. It's not a failure situation because um, workflows are really good at waiting. That's what a workflow engine can do. It can keep that state persistent and you can wait there until the worker becomes available or until some human has to do something, until uh, some response message arrives or whatever the event is you're waiting for. Right? Um, that's exactly what the workflow engine can do. Um, and it's not keeping any threat blocked. It doesn't have a timeout. It doesn't cost you money on the Lambda invocation. Right. Cool. So um, that's the happy path. That works. Um, the next thing uh, we need to do is actually um, we want to have that book trip function, right? Because we um, still need to provide this. Um, that's a different Lambda. And what I want to do um, already, I want to kick off the um, deployment of it because that takes a bit and um, I can use that time to explain what, what it actually deploys. <laughs> so if we go there, um, we're in the ZV AWS example. Do, do, do. Um, there you can see that I have the that small JavaScript function again. It uses the ZV node client so that can directly connect to the workflow engine. Um, again, I get some input. Then I connect to Kamoda Cloud. I use a couple of environment variables to do that. Um, that reminds me of that I have to set them correctly, actually. So in my serverless um, config, I have to set my cluster ID. That means I have to deploy again. Um, but that doesn't matter. Um, we say this is my function. Please, cluster ID, then client ID, where's my function, function, function there, client ID, da, da, da. client secret, this one. Wow. So we start that. We um, have to redeploy that as soon as that deployment is through. Um, but I don't want to cancel it because I had bad experience with a serverless framework and canceling things that are in progress. Um, we could actually also um, change the um, environment variables via the AWS console, but I probably don't want to do that. So um, let's wait for that to happen and then we're um, redeploying. Right, so um, this is um, where it basically connects to um, Kamoda Cloud. Um, and then I can create a new workflow instance of the trip booking. And this trip booking ID comes from the workflow definition. So that's basically what we decided here. And I hand over some data. And that's more or less it. Then I have the trip booking started, right? And what I can do next is that um, I can use a request here, um, which I can then send over using a small curl command like here. So I can use curl basically to send that request to the endpoint I just get from my deployment, right? Um, run console. Um, so I have an endpoint. I can use that endpoint actually because the endpoint will not change. And um, now it redeploys to correct basically the environment variables. In I need my curl. And in the request, what I basically send over are the variables which then are used by the functions. So for example, um, this one, 
simulates a hotel failure. There's no failure, no failure in booking the car, but there will be a failure in booking the flight. Okay. So as soon as this is there, I can basically um, send over uh, the request. Um, I wait for that and quickly pause the recording for it. Okay, it got deployed, um, so I can send over that request. Let's do that. And then, right, so that did work. Then I can go to uh, my upgrade instance, go back, already see a uh, running instance. I can also um, show all the finished instances and sort them by time. That's what I normally do. And then I, this is the latest one. What you can see is now it didn't like went to the trip box, but went the other way. You can see all the data, um, which you basically got back from the different um, calls. So that's pretty convenient here. Um, we could also see in the logs of AWS that the Lambda was called. That might not be too uh, too interesting, but just to prove it quickly, the book hotel, for example. Um, then we can see, hey, there was a hotel booked. Awesome. So the first one from the thing I started from the modeler, the second one from the real, uh, the real thing. Right. There also had a body with the right data. Cool. 